By the definition of the operations on the complex plane, it's pretty clear how to apply polynomials and rational functions to complex values. But so far, we haven't mentioned anything about applying the elementary transcendental functions of real analysis, sine, cosine, and so on, to complex values. It turns out that in complex analysis, all these functions are much more closely related than they are in real analysis. And in fact, they all boil down to, in some sense, the exponential function. And so in this program, we're going to discuss the exponential function and its associate, the logarithm. So let's start right away with the definition of the exponential function. Now we have to take one definition, and we've taken one of a number for which there is some motivation in the unit. And here it is written down here. X of Z is e to the x times cosine of y plus i sine y, where, of course, z equals x plus i y, and e to the x cos and sine are the usual functions of real analysis. Now, no definition of x is very much good unless it satisfies the properties we've come to expect of x. The first of these is the addition formula. x of z1 plus z2 equals x of z1 times x of z2. And this is fairly easy to prove from the definition given here. More important, perhaps, than this is the differentiation formula for x. The derivative of x, x prime, should just equal x. Now, this is a little harder to prove and is the subject of one of the theorems in unit three. It's not really too difficult. Well, let's come on to calculate um, some values of x. Before doing that, there are two observations worth making. The first is about the modulus of the exponential function. Modulus of x, z, is just e to the x. Also, an argument of x, z, is y. All right, then, let's look at a particular uh, point, 1 plus i. What is x of 1 plus i? Well, let's draw the complex plane in. Here is 1 plus i. So this distance is x and this y, and they're both 1. Where does x of 1 plus i lie? Well, an argument of x 1 plus i is y, which is 1. So we have an angle of about 1, which is, say, well, angle of 1, which is about pi by 3. Now, where on this line does x 1 plus i lie? Well, modulus of x 1 plus i is e to the 1, which is e. So we go out e along here, and we end up with x 1 plus i. All right, then. Now, no uh, exponential function in the complex plane can be much good, of course, unless it agrees with the exponential function of real analysis on the real line. And it's easy to see that this one does. In particular, x of 0 is just 1. Now let's look at some values of x at other points in the complex plane. x of 0 is 1, and x of any real number x is just real e to the power x. The image of the real line is the positive reals. x of a real number plus 2 pi i is also a positive real. Increasing the imaginary part moves the image round a circle. The image of the complex plane is the plane minus the origin.
So it seems that every non-zero point is the image under exp of some value. But let's check that algebraically now. In other words, let's solve the equation xz equals w for z, where w is non-zero. Well, the first thing we do is take the modulus of both sides, and we get e to the x equals mod w. And now we're in read analysis, and we can solve for x, and we get x equals logarithm of mod w. The real logarithm, and this is why you see that w should be non-zero, because otherwise this wouldn't be in the domain of log. Well, what about y now? Well, let's write down what we have so far. We know that w equals mod w times cos theta plus i sine theta for some theta. And we know that x of z equals e to the x cos y plus i sine y. And therefore, since this equals this and this equals this, by equating the real parts, cos theta equals cos y, and the imaginary sine theta equals sine y. And that means that not quite y equals theta, but that y equals theta plus 2n pi for some n. And therefore, z equals log mod w plus i theta plus 2n pi i. And so we've solved for z. In fact, though, we have rather too many solutions for z. You see, we had an ulterior motive in solving this equation. We wanted to uh, compute the inverse function of exp. But as you've seen, exp is not 1, 1. It's many 1, and therefore doesn't have an inverse function. Well, let's draw out the solutions of uh, exp z equals w. Here's a point um, w. Now, the things which map to w, well, there's one of them in particular, this one here. Let's call that z0. And then there are other points at intervals 2 pi i up and down the plane. So infinitely many points map to w. In fact, exp is periodic with period 2 pi i. Well, we can't solve um, for an inverse globally, as one might say. Let's try and solve locally. Suppose one took a little chunk, a little region like this around w. Now, the points in here would, in fact, come from a little rectangle like this. And copies of this all the way up and down the plane at intervals of 2 pi i. I won't draw all of them. Now, if this region is small enough, these rectangles will be small enough so that they don't overlap. And so if I restrict exp to one of them, say this one, I get a 1, 1 function. And so I can take the inverse function. Well, that's all very well, but uh, this region is rather small. How can we find um, a larger region? Well, I can certainly, if I add a little bit on here, all that does is push this bit out like this. That's not doing any harm. I can go this way. I can also go this way. And in fact, I can fill out this to an infinite strip of this width. Suppose I want to add now a bit, though, up here. Now, this is more dangerous, as you can see from this side. It's getting close to the next rectangle. On the other side, it corresponds to pushing round this little sector. And if I pushed it round too far, it would come all the way around and catch itself up, and that would be very dangerous. So we have to be a bit more careful. And let's see now how one goes about doing this. Let's start with exp of 0 equals 1.
we can take exp of any real number and of numbers whose imaginary part is small between pi and minus pi. Well, we found a large region on which exp is 1, 1. In fact, as large a region as possible. And such a region we call a fundamental region for exp. So, in this case, the fundamental region is this strip here lying between minus pi i and plus pi i. The, and on this, the function exp is 1, 1. The image of this strip is a region of the following sort. It's the plane, but with the points along the non-positive real axis removed, cut away, as one might say. And so we call this region a cut plane. On the cut plane, exp has an inverse, which we denote by capital L O G, or principal branch of logarithm, if you want to say it in full. We'll call it log normally. Let's now try and find a formula for log. Since it's an inverse, we know that exp of log z is z. And by our formula for solving this equation, we know that log z equals logarithm of mod z plus i times some argument of z. Which argument? The argument lying between minus pi and pi. Well, we already have a name for that. It's just arg z. And the capital A goes with a capital L. Well, then, that's the formula for log z. Let's calculate some values of log z. Let's start with a really easy one, first of all. Log of 2. Well, 2 is a real number, and so its argument is 0. So we throw that part away, and we just get logarithm of 2, a real number. Well, let's try a genuine complex number now. Let's calculate log of 1 plus i. Well, certainly, it starts off with log of the modulus of 1 plus i, so we have to f find out what the modulus is. Now, it's very helpful in this situation to draw a little picture, most importantly, to get the argument. The modulus isn't usually too much trouble. We want to get the argument. Here's 1 plus i. Its modulus is the length of this line, which is root 2. And its argument is this angle here, which is pi over 4. So we get log of 1 plus i is log root 2 plus i times the argument, which is pi over 4. That's not too difficult. How about another one? Log of 1 minus i. Well, 1 minus i lies down here. And so by symmetry, its modulus is the same. What about its argument? Well, the argument has to lie between minus pi and pi. And so certainly, minus pi over 4 will do. So we get logarithm of the modulus, root 2, minus i times pi over 4, because the argument is negative. That's all going very well, then. But what about log of minus 1? Well, let's put minus 1 in the picture. It's here. And that's not very good, because minus 1 lies in the cut of the cut plane, which is the domain of log. And therefore, log of minus 1 is undefined. Well, never mind. Perhaps we could have chosen another fundamental region on which log, on which exp, would have had an inverse, in whose domain minus 1 might lie. Perhaps we can do that. To see why one should be able to do that, think of this. The equation xz equals minus 1 certainly has solutions, and we could take one of these solutions and push out from it in both directions to try and get a fundamental region. Let's see now how that would work. This time we'll start with exp of pi i equals minus 1.
we can take x of any number whose imaginary part is between 0 and 2 pi. This time we found a different fundamental region, a different strip from the one we had before. Here it is. It's the strip lying between 0 and 2 pi i. On it, exp, let's call it r. On it, exp is 1, 1. The image is again a cut plane. This time the cut is along the non-negative real axis. So we can take the inverse function which, for want of a better name, we'll just call LR. Now, what about a formula for LR? Well, exp of LR of Z is Z. And so LR of Z is logarithm of mod Z, as before, plus I theta where theta is the argument of z lying between 0 and 2 pi. Oh, we haven't got a name for that. Let's just call it theta. But let's now calculate some values of LR. Let's start off with the one we couldn't do last time, the value of minus 1 under LR. We'll again put it in the picture. Minus 1 is here. Its argument is this angle, which is pi. So LR of minus 1 is log of the modulus, which is log 1, plus I times the correct argument, which is pi. Log 1 plus I pi simplifies to I pi. And let's now look through our, the other complex numbers we had before. What about? LR of 1 plus I. Here's 1 plus I. We know it's modulus. And this angle here is the argument, the correct argument in this case, pi over 4. So we get log root 2 plus I times pi over 4. In fact, that's the same answer as we had last time. What about LR of 1 minus i? Here is 1 minus i. We know it's modulus. What about the correct argument? Well, this time, we can't use this angle here, because it's negative, And theta must lie between 0 and 2 pi. The angle we want is this angle. Which, if you think about it for a moment, is 7 pi over 4. So LR of 1 minus i is logarithm of the modulus, root 2, plus i times 7 pi over 4. This time, it's not the same answer. It's 2 pi i more than we had before. Well. Let's investigate the relationship between LR and log. What can we say in general about it? Let's prove something. Well, here are the two formulas. Suppose, first of all, I take a Z in this part of the plane. In other words, the imaginary part of Z is greater than 0. Then LR of Z is logarithm of mod z plus i theta. Well, let's draw a typical such z in. Here it is. Here's theta. That's the correct argument for LR. But theta is just arg z. This is arg z. So we just simplify this to log z. All right, then. What about for a z down here. That's when the imaginary part of z is negative. Well, LR of z, we can start off again, is logarithm of mod z plus i times 
theta. Let's draw a picture again. Here's a z. Now, arg z is this angle, whereas theta is this angle. In fact, theta is just arg z plus 2 pi. And taking this and this together, we get log z. And what's left over is 2 pi i. So they're pretty closely related. Of course, again, we can't um, calculate LR of 2, because 2, for example, would lie in that cut. And this is a general situation. But usually, if you have a point that you want to get information on, you can choose a fundamental region so that the inverse of x on that region will have that point in its domain. And let's see some examples of that now. As we change the fundamental region, we change the cut in the plane. Enough of this extravagance. Let's look at a plain formula involving logarithms. Is it true that this formula holds? Well, the only way to see if it is true is to prove it. I won't do the details. It's fairly easy to establish that exp of log of z1, z2 equals exp of log z1 plus log z2. And therefore, log of z1, z2 equals log of z1 plus log of z2, oh dear, plus 2n pi i, which creeps in because x isn't 1, 1. Well, can we get rid of this n? Well, you think about it. Try looking at z1 equals z2 equals minus 1 plus i. Anyway, once we have exponential and logarithm, we can go on to define the other functions, sine, hyperbolic, powers and roots, and so on. It all goes very similar to the case in real analysis, except for the two problems of fundamental regions and cut planes.